Well, good morning, everyone. We'd like to uh, welcome you to our services today. I am in the middle of a three-part series on the seven statements or seven words from the cross. And we'll be reading today from the book of John, chapter 19. John 19, beginning with verse 26 for our scripture this morning. As I said last week, the Gospels record seven sayings that Jesus spoke from the cross. Does that include everything that he spoke? I suspect probably not. But these seven uh, sayings were recorded specifically, in my opinion, for a reason. I don't think anything's in the Bible by accident. And uh, perhaps they're included because the number seven is God's perfect number. I don't know. Uh, that's prob possibly why these seven sayings are included. But I do know that as Jesus hung on the cross, he made seven significant statements. These have been called the seven words from the cross. They represent the basic needs of mankind. Last week I covered the first statement in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, I know that that particular prayer pertained to those who were there that day. But in my opinion, that prayer pertains to us as well and to everyone uh, who needs God's forgiveness, which, of course, includes all of us. And then the second saying was found in Luke 23, 43. He spoke to the thief on the cross. I call it the cross of repentance. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Where the first prayer was for a general, mankind in general, this particular statement zeroed in on one particular individual. So God sees not only the whole world, but He sees each one of us individually. Now today I'd like to cover the next two words from the cross, and uh, Lord willing, the um, other three next Sunday. The third word is found in John 19, starting with verse 16. The soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. We sang about Calvary uh, this morning. That is another translation. And um, you may have seen pictures of Golgotha. And in the old pictures, it actually had the resemblance of a skull. There were two uh, recessed areas that uh, kind of uh, looked a little bit like eyes, and then there was an area projecting out that looked kind of like the bridge of a nose. And so theologians speculate that maybe that's where it got its name. Uh, we were there a year ago, November, and our guide said that they had a rare ice storm. And some of the bridge of the nose crumbled uh, during that freeze, and so now it doesn't resemble a skull at all. There, I can see no resemblance to a skull. But anyway, it was called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. There were a lot of people that came by this intersection, and a lot of people would see this sign written in three different languages, and uh, the chief priests of the Jews protested. They said, don't write king of the Jews, but the, that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And for once, Pilate grew a backbone. <laughs> he said, what I have written, I have written. He stood his ground this time. Verse 23, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. Today we might uh, throw dice or flip a coin or whatever. They decided by lot. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. That is in Psalm 22:18. if you'd like to look it up. So this is what the soldiers did. Verse 25, 
Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, which was John, the writer of the book, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, and here's our third statement from the cross. Dear woman, most versions just say woman. King James says woman. Here is your son. And to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took Mary into his home, or you could translate it home to be with him, because his father Zebedee and his mother Salome were both still alive. John is the only one of the apostles with the courage to take his stand here at the foot of the cross. So there you have it, Jesus from the cross, speaks to Mary and says, here is your son. He speaks to John. He says, here is your mother. That's the third statement from the cross. The first word, Father, forgive them, addressed a basic need of all mankind. The second word, you will be with me in paradise, narrowed its focus to the individual. It ministered salvation to a single penitent sinner. And I don't think there's any doubt among any of us that we will see that repentant sinner in heaven because Jesus promised him, today you will be with me in paradise. But that thief on the cross never had the opportunity to live out the implications of that salvation. He never, never had a chance to join a church or get baptized or share the gospel. or He never had a chance to do any of that to live out the impl implications of being a Christian. And there are implications. There is evidence. Once a person is truly saved, they're different. There are things that people can see. This third word today introduces one of those implications. What does it look like to be a Christian? And that is loving relationships. They asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment. He said, of course, love God and love your neighbor. Loving relationships is one of the implications of being saved. All people, whether they realize it or not, need the kind of love that Jesus showed in his life and death. John got it. He understood because his gospel contains some of the most important statements that Jesus ever made about love. For example, John 15, 13, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. John saw it. He witnessed it right here as Jesus laid down his life for all mankind. John 3, 16, we're so familiar with, probably the most familiar passage in the entire Bible. John got it. He understood loving relationships. Here in verses 26 and 27, we get a glimpse into the heart of Jesus. Now, most theologians agree that Joseph must have been... Uh, passed away by this time. There's no mention of him, and uh, it's pretty much agreed that there was no Joseph, there was no one to take care of Mary. At this point, uh, Jesus would be going back to his Father in heaven, and particularly in that culture, uh, women needed someone to care for them. And Jesus is asking John to demonstrate what it means to be a follower of Jesus. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here's your son, and to the disciple, here's your mother. And from that time on, I don't see any evidence of any kind of hesitation, any kind of arguing, any kind of reluctance. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. He modeled it. He lived it. He practiced what he preached. Now we can only speculate at that point in time what Mary was thinking, what she was going through, beholding the agony of her son. I can't imagine what, she, what that must have been like to have to watch that transpire and be helpless to do anything about it. I wonder if she was reminded of those words when she presented the baby Jesus in the temple. The priest prophesied, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against 
so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And then the prophet went on to say, a sword will pierce your own soul also. I wonder if she recalled those statements spoken some 33 years before. That sword was piercing her heart at this point, I'm sure. Well, we don't know what she was thinking about, but we know what Jesus was thinking about. In the midst of this excruciating pain, in the midst of this embarrassment, this humiliation, and this torture, Jesus was not thinking about himself. He was thinking about his mother. Who's going to take care of her when I am gone? That gives us a glimpse into his heart. That gives us insight into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. John got the message. He understood, and he took Mary into his home. Now, it's particularly in the King James and most other versions that I checked, the fact that he would call her woman seems a little unusual. I don't know if any of your, uh, you mothers out there, I don't know if any of your children have ever referred to you as woman, but, but wouldn't you think that would be a little strange? And it does appear strange on the surface. But as you study, you realize that that was no disrespect whatsoever in their culture. To refer to a male as man or to a female as woman was a sign of respect, just like sir or madam would be to us today. So he was, he was conveying no disrespect whatsoever, but why didn't he call her mother? Some commentators speculate that Mary must no longer think of him primarily as her son. Their relationship was about to change. Jesus was no longer primarily her son. He was to become her Lord. Mary must begin to look upon Jesus as her Lord. And as I thought of that, I, I thought to one of the most popular Christmas songs in the last few years, Mary, did you know? And you know, that song poses some interesting questions. I like to, I like to speculate and, and wonder, how much did Mary understand throughout Jesus' life, when he was born, and as he was growing up, and as she was raising him, and at this point on the cross as she was looking up at him, how much did she understand at this point? Mary, did you know your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know your baby boy has come to make you new? Did you know the child you delivered would soon deliver you? Did she understand all that? Did you know your baby boy has walked where angels trod, and when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God? Did she grasp that? Did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Did you know your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb, that he's the great I am, <laughs> that would have been hard for a mother to wrap her head around, I think. This third word from the cross also reveals something about his relationship with John. What an honor had been bestowed upon John at this point in time to care for the mother of Jesus. What trust Jesus placed in John at this point to take Mary into his own home. Someone said that this word from the cross is the least theological but the most practical application of the gospel message. John was putting it into practice. And when theory is translated into practice, that's when our relationship with Christ becomes observable reality. That's what people are looking for. They're looking for people that walk the talk. That's what John was doing. In fact, John himself wrote these words in chapter 13, verse 35, By this all men will know that ye are my disciples, if you love one another. John had an opportunity here to put that into practice in taking in the mother of Jesus. And he passed the test. He practiced what he preached. He demonstrated love by taking Mary into his home. Now tradition says that John cared for Mary until her death. 
some estimate eight to, I heard as many as 11 years, took care of her until her death. He then moved to Ephesus, where he had a long and successful ministry. The Ephesian elders urged John to record his memories of the li his life with Jesus, and that's where we get the Gospel of John. Some have speculated that this is the reason that John is the only disciple who died a natural death, because Jesus had entrusted him to take care of his mother. Well, this word, the third word, tells us that there's love at the cross, and it's a love that's to be shared. And John modeled it for us. The fourth word. It's found in the book of Matthew. Not all the Gospels record every word, so we have to put all four Gospels together to get the seven words from the cross. Found in Matthew 27, verse 45, darkness came over all the land. In the middle of the day, it became dark. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you ask why, you're in good company. We, we human beings like to know why, don't we? Probably all of us have asked that question numerous times. God, why? Maybe you're asking that question now. Why this virus? Why this lockdown? Why all of this unemployment? Why the death? Why the isolation? Why, Lord? Why don't you stop this? Maybe you felt that very way that Jesus felt on that cross. God, why have you forsaken me? That word can mean forgotten or abandoned. Probably most of us have felt that way at one point in time. Hey, God, you know, I'm down here, you know. Have you forgotten me? There's a commentary, word pictures in the New Testament, says nothing from Jesus so well illustrates the depth of his suffering. Regarded as sin, though sinless. The Son of God bearing the sin of the world this cry of desolation comes at the close of three hours of darkness. You think you've had a bad day. No one has ever had a worse day than this day. Jesus had never known what it felt like to bear the guilt and the shame of sin. He had never known what it felt like to have the perfect relationship, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He'd never known what it felt like to have that disrupted. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin. Never sinned, never knew what it felt like, never knew guilt or shame, became the epitome of it. I don't know about you, but I've done some things in my lifetime that I felt guilty about. Can you imagine piling all the guilt that you have ever felt and that everyone who's ever lived has ever felt and piling it on one person at one time and asking that person to bear it. I can't imagine the weight. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God took our sin and placed it on Jesus. As He made atonement for our sin, it was necessary that even the Father should stand aside. Just like the scapegoat in the Old Testament had to be banished into the wilderness. So Jesus had to bear the sin of the world alone, outside the city, to take away the sin of the people. He was feeling the punishment of the sinner. Being separated from God, His humiliation was complete. I really think this was the worst part for him. I think in the garden the night before, he knew what he was in for. He knew what was ahead, and I think that was why that was such an excruciating evening. The stress upon him was so great that great drops like blood oozed from his pores. I've never known stress like that. I think this was the worst part. I think the physical part paled in comparison. 
bearing the sin of the world, dying a sinner's death. He was carrying out His Father's will in becoming the atoning sacrifice for our sin. I'm going to close with an old hymn that probably most of you have heard. We used to sing it years ago. He could have called 10,000 angels. Maybe you're familiar with the words. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where He prayed. They led Him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify Him. He's to blame. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set Him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but He died alone for you and me. Upon His precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the King. They cursed Him. They struck Him, mocked His holy name. All alone He suffered everything. When they nailed Him to the cross, His mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave Him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded. He did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it is finished, and gave himself to die, salvation's wondrous plan was done. It is finished. Lord Willen will speak about that saying next week. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. This word from the cross points us to the cost of the atonement. The cost. We can't even comprehend what it costs God. Thank God for that atonement. Shall we pray? Father, thank you is just totally inadequate to express our thanksgiving, our gratitude, our appreciation for what you did there to provide the possibility of reconciliation, restoration, and eternal life, abundant life here and forever. We just thank you so much. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to live each and every day as an expression of that gratitude. If there be those, Lord, that are listening to this message today that haven't experienced the benefits of the atonement, they've never uh, trusted you as Lord and Savior, we just pray, Lord, that that would be the case uh, just now. We pray, Lord, uh, for your continued blessing on the remainder of this day. We pray that you bless our drive-in service to follow, and we'll give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.